Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Continuing Medical Education Podcast. Join us each week to discuss the most pressing topics in cardiology and gain valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Kopetsky, a preventive cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. It's a great pleasure today to be speaking with Dr. Ray Squires, professor of medicine, also in the Division of Cardiovascular Disease Prevention here in Mayo, Rochester. Welcome, Ray. Thanks for inviting me to your podcast, Steve. It's a pleasure. The, um, what we'll be talking about today is cardio-oncology rehabilitation. Now, Dr. Squires has been uh, involved intimately in our cardiac rehab program for, shall I say, Ray, more than a decade. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. The, um, and Ray helped start it here and has been involved. And this new concept of, of cardio-oncology rehab is something that's new to many of us because we didn't used to have this. How long has this been around, Ray? Uh, Cardio-oncology rehabilitation has been around probably since about 2015 or so. Uh, we started our program in 2017. And in 2019, the American Heart Association, with endorsement of the American uh, uh, Cancer Society, uh, published a rationale for partnering with existing cardiac rehabilitation programs to bring cancer patients into those programs uh, for the explicit purpose of supervised exercise training and modification of cardiovascular risk factors. So they came out with this white papers or guideline, basically, saying we should scientific do this. statement. Scientific statement. Why? Why then? Why? Why do we need to have cardiac rehab for cardio oncology patients? So, so uh, cancer patients are uh, obviously a very diverse. Uh, group of, of clinical patients, but they have some commonalities. And one of the commonalities is that uh, patients who have cancer uh, generally have a lower than expected quality of life. Uh, they have persistent fatigue that may last for months or years, even after completion of cancer therapy. They have a reduced cardiorespiratory fitness. And although guidelines for prescribing exercise for cancer patients have been available for a while. The vast majority of patients with cancer are not physically active. They have below average cardiorespiratory fitness. They average approximately 30% lower than age and, and gender matched populations. So they really need to have some, some way of improving their ability to exercise. In addition to that, cancer patients have a heightened cardiovascular risk compared to people who are just like them that don't have cancer. This is partially due to the presence of traditional coronary risk factors, but it's also due to the multi-system effects of cancer and cancer therapies on potential cardiotoxicity. There have been studies that have shown that exercise training in patients with cancer will improve cardiorespiratory fitness and will reduce cardiovascular events. That's important. Uh, cardiorespiratory fitness is a major marker for cardiovascular health. It's inversely related to cardiovascular events. And are those prospective studies or observational studies, or how, how have they been run to show the benefit? So one of the limitations with cardio-oncology rehabilitation at the present time is the evidence base is very new. It's nascent, and we need to build the, the, the database. So the primary source for data regarding cardio-oncology rehabilitation in cancer patients comes from patients with breast cancer. It's, it's expanding now into other, other cancer sites, but uh, we definitely need to expand the, the database. That's a fascinating concept, and many of our listeners may not know, but the number one reason a woman with breast cancer dies is actually cardiovascular disease, exactly. not the breast cancer. Yeah, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in most early malignancies. That's fascinating. The, so the core, as we're calling it, the cardio-oncology rehabilitation, <clears throat> what is it a one-size-fits-all? Does every patient uh, need the same type of exercise, or do you, do you tailor it for the type of cancer, or obviously the type of patient, too? So obviously, with any clinical population, an exercise program needs to be individualized. And so there's all sorts of things we take into consideration before we prescribe exercise for cancer patients. 
It's important to note that core or cardio-oncology rehabilitation, that can occur at any point on the cancer continuum. It can occur at the point of diagnosis, it can occur during treatment, it can occur after treatment. So as you might expect, there's lots and lots of variability in terms of how much exercise patients can do, uh, the effects of cancer treatment on fatigue and their ability to exercise train. So it's actually fascinating for our exercise physiologists that work with these patients in terms of individualizing the program for each patient. Mm -hmm. Now, now, Ray, I, I'm a cancer survivor. I had radiation therapy uh, 30 years ago. About 25 years ago, I had chemotherapy. I did not feel like doing much exercise <laughs> during those times. So what do you tell these patients when they are just wiped out from the radiation or wiped out from the chemo? Do you stop all activity or, or just try to do minor amount? So that's a really good question. And with your experience, it's, it's pretty typical for patients who are undergoing chemotherapy or radiation therapy to have profound fatigue. And so a patient who's involved with CORE during treatment, and about half of our patients that we see in our program are actually there during treatment, uh, we really need to be aware of their side effects, and we have to change the way that we think about progressing the exercise dose. In a typical cardiac rehabilitation program, say someone who's post-myocardial infarction, we generally increase the dose of exercise every week. With a patient in core who's undergoing treatment, we call this non-linear progression, where one week we may progress the exercise dose, and the next week the patient be, may be more symptomatic and we have to back off on the dose. So we have to be very careful that we don't exhaust the patients and we don't uh, do something that will... Uh, basically tell the patient that exercise is not working for them. Yeah. Do you, is there a minimum you try to get them to do on a regular basis, or is that concept not there for core? Well, it's interesting you ask that. Uh, so we look at uh, guidelines for cancer patients published by the American College of Sports Medicine, the American Heart Association, and the American uh, Cancer Society, and we adapted them based on our own clinical experience over the last four or five years. And we had recently published a paper in the Journal of Cardiopulmonary Rehabilitation and Prevention. It was written, the primary author was Adam Schultz, who's one of our clinical exercise physiologists. I was involved. We had three of our oncology colleagues involved as well. And the title of the paper is Cardio-Oncology Rehabilitation, Exercise Prescription and Programming, a Practical Guide. So in this paper, it has a table that basically gives a summary of what we recommend uh, practitioners in core think about when prescribing exercise for patients. And so we have frequency, intensity, duration, type of exercise, progression of the exercise dose for aerobic or cardiovascular exercise, resistance training, and then flexibility exercise. And again, it depends upon the patient, what their initial level of fitness is, their degree of frailty, the amount of side effects they're having, where they are on the cancer continuum in terms of treatment and remission, et cetera, in terms of how we do this. But basically, if you're looking at a, a kind of a kernel of truth in terms of what we tell patients to do with their exercise, for aerobic or cardiovascular exercise, the goal is to increase exercise frequency to three to seven days a week, gradually increase duration to 30 minutes or more at a moderate intensity. Most of the cancer patients we see progress to the point where they can also perform high intensity interval training, at least for part of their training sessions. For resistance training, we basically promote two to three sessions per week uh, basically using all major muscle groups of the body, and this could be using elastic bands, hand weights, weight machines, body weight, on a two to three day per week basis, uh, exercising for one set of eight to 15 slow repetitions, again, avoiding fatigue, avoiding complete exhaustion. And then for flexibility work, the real goal is maintaining or improving flexibility. We recommend those kinds of exercises on a daily basis. So that's kind of a kernel or an over, overview of what we would generally recommend for the average patient with cancer. Not very much different than what we would recommend for other clinical populations that we see. And then is it, it's been shown in the non-cancer population that we also need to not be sedentary. 
we need to get up and move every hour or so. Is the same uh, same finding with oncology patients? We don't have data yet to back that up, but we certainly tell patients to avoid prolonged periods of sitting. And we tell them to be active during the day rather than passive. Okay. So it's very similar to what we have our, our normal, our non-oncology patients do, maybe a little more tailored. A little bit more tailored. And one thing we'll say is the, the, the personnel, the staff that works with these patients, they need additional education to their typical clinical, edu clinical exercise physiology education. And there is a certification for the, from the American College of Sports Medicine, certified cancer trainer, that we would recommend that uh, exercise professionals who are considering working with cancer patients obtain. Yeah, that's terrific. It's actually a certified it is. area now. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. The, now, Ray, here at Mayo, we have this concept of ECG age. We have an artificial intelligence that analyzes every ECG that's done. And I know the, uh, the National Cancer Institute's pointed out patients that undergo chemotherapy, their average ECG age is 10 years older than their chronologic age. It is, have we seen any evidence that we can benefit these patients with ECG age with the core? Haven't seen that yet, but that would be a fascinating project to, to engage in. Yes. We'll have to speak after the podcast and come up with some ideas. Yes. Well, I, uh, I can tell you that my, my ECG age, before my chemotherapy, my ECG was a year older than I was chronologically. And I figured I was going to die of cancer. Of course, I, I read about it and found out that my odds, I was going to die of heart disease because I'm a, you know, a ma male in this country. And now my ECG age with my lifestyle change over the last couple of decades is 17 years younger than my chronologic age. Oh, that's good. That's an N of one, but it's very impressive. It, it is an N of one, but uh, it makes me feel better. <laughs> the um, so basically, you you point out to us very nicely that the uh, the ECG or the uh, the the core patients need to be more active. You have a program for them now. Is this how how many core programs are there around the country? That's a good question. I really don't know. There've been relatively few uh, publications in the area. Uh, so there are a few leading programs around the country, but I really can't tell you what percentage of cardiac rehabilitation programs are, are involved with CORE. And I should tell you, tell you this. One of the problems with CORE is reimbursement. So we need to figure out a reimbursement strategy for these patients. And to tell you the truth right now, at Mayo, we don't make money seeing these CORE patients. We uh, the bean counters don't like me to say this, but we basically give away a lot of the things that we're doing with these patients. But it helps our patients. And that's it helps our patients. Thing. It keeps them out of the hospital. Overall, I think it's going to reduce health care costs. Yes. Now, if they, I assume if they have other reimbursable issues, heart failure, what about dyspnea on exertion? Is that covered? Dyspnea on exertion is not covered unless they have underlying pulmonary disease. That would be covered under a pulmonary rehabilitation CPT code. Okay. So you point out to us, we have this program. It's a certifiable program. It's shown benefits. It is aimed at the cancer patients whose, many of them, their most common cause of death is actually heart disease, not cancer. Um, it's not clear how, how, how much this is going to benefit them, but the early data shows it clearly does benefit them. We know that it improves cardiovascular fitness, cardiorespiratory fitness, and it does reduce events, at least in patients with breast cancer. But we, as I said earlier, we need to expand the database. Excellent message overall. And this can be done by any cardiac rehab program in the country. Any program that is willing to do it. Right. And we're encouraging this. Yes, certainly so. I, I certainly endorse it as a cancer survivor. I think it, the exercise, if nothing else, helps your mental attitude as much as anything you can do to say, hey, I'm doing this. I'm going to beat this disease. Well, I should I should mention there is data in cancer survivors that exercise training in depressed patients actually reduces depression. So yes, very true. I, I can attest to that. Well, Ray, it's been great speaking with you. Any any last uh, minute? Anything else we need to cover we haven't covered yet? No, I think you've been good in your questions. Uh, I think this is a great topic. There's always something new to talk about on these podcasts, and I appreciate your including me with you. Great. Well, maybe we'll have to bring you back in the future as you get more data, because uh, we have great databases here at Mayo, and hopefully we'll... Uh, is the, are the NCCTG and the cancer treatment groups getting on board with this and yes. studying it? Yes, they are. So yeah. we'll have data coming out. We'll have data, years. yes. That's great. Well, thank you, Dr. Ray Squire. It's been a great pleasure talking to you about this very important subject. 
Thank you, Steve. Thank you for joining us today. Feel free to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast by emailing cvselfstudy at mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in each week to explore today's most pressing cardiology topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic.